Nearly two weeks after her murder, Kitty Genovese was on her way to becoming just another victim in a city where hundreds of people are killed every year. But a lunchtime sit-down between the police commissioner and a New York Times editor quickly changed all of that. After the meeting, the Times ran this story on the front page, reporting that nearly 40 people had watched for more than half an hour as a killer stalked and stabbed Kitty Genovese. The article was soon picked up and circulated across the globe, but that version of events, based in part on information from the police commissioner, has since been widely discredited. More recently, the Times also corrected its reporting to say that, quote, the portrayal of 38 witnesses as fully aware and unresponsive was erroneous. Still, that original story would go on to shape public perception of the case, framing New York City as a cold and uncaring metropolis. Joining me now with more on all of this, how the media got it wrong and the impact that sensationalism can have on a story is investigative journalist, author, and a good friend from a long time ago, Diane mm -hmm. Diamond. It is always good to see you. You too, you too. The first question you have to ask is, it's the New York Times. Mm -hmm. How did they get that story so wrong? Well, you know, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback, looking back. Today, we'd call it sloppy reporting. An editor tells a reporter, hey, 38 people were watching for half an hour and nobody picked up the phone to call the police. And the reporter apparently took that at face value. I mean, they got it from a high-ranking NYP uh, official. And so why wouldn't you believe it? But I don't, I don't think there was a lot of canvassing door to door to try to find some of these 38 people. I think it was more like half a dozen people. So much of your career, you have focused on the, these sensational stories and crimes and trials. When you look at this, what do you think it was about the Kitty, Kitty Genovese story that resonated so and, and that really propelled it into being this, this astonishing story? Turns out now, not entirely true, right. but something that grabbed so many people. Oh yeah, it was so sensational and went nationwide almost immediately. Um, I think it, it was because it came from the New York Times. You know, the, the paper every reporter reads and loves to quote. Um, that, first of all. But uh, I think even more important were the numbers. 38 people watched for 30 or 35 minutes and nobody picked up the phone. It assaulted our senses, our sensibilities. Certainly we would never have done that. We would have picked up the telephone. But of course now we know People did pick up the telephone, and, and one 70-year-old woman ran to Kitty's side and held her as she was bleeding in a vestibule. So it wasn't what it was portrayed to be. Once the story becomes a, a public narrative, mm -hmm. why is it so hard to change it? Well, that's like putting toothpaste back in the tube. You, you know, once it hits that sensational track, it's really hard to reel it back because people read the first story, the second story, they talk amongst themselves, but they don't read the correction. And we're seeing that today with um, lots of stories, but Ferguson, Missouri comes to my mind. There are still people who believe that Michael Brown was on his knees in the street saying, don't shoot, when of course his autopsy shows us that he was literally charging the officer and hit by a bullet on the top of his head as he was charging. But it's hard to reel it back. People believe what they want to believe. You and I have covered a lot of the same stories um, going mm -hmm. back over the years. We and sure we've, have. we've seen the changes in, in media and how the media covers high profile criminal cases, especially. I, I've often bemoaned much of that change. How do you look at it? I'm right there with you, bemoaning all the way. Um, you know, I think our, our, our best schools are still journeying out, uh, churning out good journalists. But today, Everybody calls themselves a journalist, you know, a blogger. I'm a journalist. On the internet, there's this click and bait stuff that readers really need to be careful about. What do you mean by that? So our, make sure our viewers know what you're talking about when we're talking about. Well, when you're on bait. the internet and you're reading a story, say from the New York Times or the New York Post or wherever, on the side there are these little stories that little tease that you know which celebrities are aging the worst. Oh, I'm going to click it. That's not written by a journalist. None of that is written by journalism, uh, by journalists, trained journalists. And so readers need to be careful, in my opinion, where they get their news and how much weight they give it. Uh, you know, if, if you're a serious journalist and you work for the New York Times or uh, I've written for Newsweek and the Daily Beast, uh, th then you know, people can be pretty uh, confident in knowing that you're sticking to facts. 
uh, if you're giving an opinion, you're labeling it as an opinion. But that's not the case in the media today. Why is that? What do you think? What do you think drives that? <sighs> oh, dollars, I suppose. The need to be sensational, get eyeballs to the television. Local news is, um, that's where I do my most bemoaning. You and I started at Local Channel 2 right. here in New York. And, and it's not just Channel 2, but their teases are such that it's like, whoa, I got to watch that story. And then after you've watched it, it really is a pretty thin story. So it's the headlines, it's the grabbiness, it's the sensationalism that I don't think we did when we were in that position, you and I. Last question for you, Coming, circling back to Kitty Genovese. Will the Kitty Genovese <laughs> narrative always be, even though now we know it's inaccurate, Will it still always be out there as the story of the uncaring, callous people in New York that would let mm -hmm. a, a young woman be stabbed to death and lie there in the street and die with no one helping her? Absolutely. Is that always going to be the story? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was taught in psychology classes. It, there was a song in which it was it, uh, mentioned. Yes, it will live on and on, just as the Michael Brown and Ferguson uh, myth will live on and on. And um, it's a shame. We should be less gullible as news consumers than that. Well, I wish we had more of our journalists like you. Diane, it's well, always good to see you. And my I'll, pleasure. I'll have to get you back here sometime. So Anytime. Chat some more. Anytime. You'd be well. Thanks.